Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of How Not To Be A Boy by Robert Webb. So as always, I'm going to read the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and start looking at some of my tabs, before giving you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This is non-fiction, Robert Webb is a comedian, and writer, and various other things. Uh, you probably recognise his face, there you go. So, rules for being a man. Don't cry. Love sport. Play rough. Drink beer. Don't talk about feelings. But Robert Webb has been wondering for some time now, are those rules actually any use to anyone? I think I might as well read you, uh, there's an interior jacket as well, so I'm going to read that. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what he's saying there. Looking back over his life, from schoolboy crushes on girls and boys, to discovering the power of making people laugh, in the Cambridge Footlights with David Mitchell and Olivia Coleman, and from, and from losing his beloved mother to becoming a husband and father, Robert Webb considers the absurd expectations boys and men have thrust upon them at every stage. All right, and then on the rear cover, it says, Robert Webb has been a male for his whole life. As such, he has been a boy in a world of fighting, pointless posturing, and the insistence that he stop crying. As an adult man, he has enjoyed better luck, both in his work as the web half of Mitchell and Webb in the Sony Award winning That Mitchell and Webb Sound and the BAFTA Award winning That Mitchell and Webb Look, and as permanent man-boy Jeremy in the acclaimed Peep Show. He also played Bertie Wooster in the acclaimed West End run of Jeeves and Wooster in Perfect Nonsense. Robert has been a columnist for the Daily Telegraph and the New Statesman and now lives in London with his wife and daughters, where he continues trying to be funny and to fumble beyond general expectations of manhood. I just fumbled the word fumble. Also, it gives me great pleasure that my tabs fit, this, fit the colour scheme of this book. So this is something I think, like, well, I can relate to anyway. It reminds me of my school days. Communal showering is a fresh hell that concludes every games lesson the way an awkward exchange of details concludes a car crash. At home, the bathroom door is always locked and, bath night aside, I never change the top half and bottom half of me at the same time. I am, in short, a never nude. In the changing room, I just about get from the bench to the shower without having a heart attack, watching my bare feet step daintily over the stud punctured turf clods on the tiled floor. I also manage not to physically flinch at the echoed shouts of my fellow 11 year olds and the acrid smell of Ralgex and Reitgard, which some of them are optimistically wafting about. I'm very proud of the spot. Big E. I'm very proud of the fine sprinkling of pubic hairs I've managed to grow, although that area in general looks like the head of a 90-year-old woman recently returned from a perm too many at the hairdressers. The hairs keep a discreet distance from each other and the essential baldness beneath catches the light. We are all, of course, surreptitiously checking each other out. I'm relieved to find that I have neither a small penis nor an unsettlingly large one. But in general, I'm hopelessly skinny, and I'm still recovering from the number two hit that year, So Macho, in which Sunita made her feelings about what was required very clear. I don't want no seven stone weakling, or a boy who thinks he's a girl. And what's really sad in which I didn't realise, he had a brother who died uh, ten months before he was born, so he never met him. He, he this, uh, died of meningitis when he was six years old. So I'm going to read this little bit out here as well, if Biggie stops me owing. What are we saying to a boy when we tell him to man up, or to act like a man? At its most benign, we might just be saying, do the thing that needs doing, even if you don't want to do it. But more often, when we tell a boy to act like a man, we're effectively saying, stop expressing those feelings. And if the boy hears that often enough, it actually starts to sound uncannily like, stop feeling those feelings. It sounds like this, pain, guilt, grief, fear, anxiety. These are not appropriate emotions for a boy because they will be unacceptable emotions for a man. The skills you need to be your own emotional detective, being able to name a feeling and work out why you're feeling it. You don't need to develop those skills, you won't need them. It sounds like a good deal. The great thing about refusing to feel feelings is that once you've denied them, you don't have to take responsibility for them. Your feelings will be someone else's problem, your mother's problem, your girlfriend's problem, your wife's problem. If it has to come out at all, let it come out as anger. You're allowed to be angry. It's boyish and manlike to be angry. Thought this was well written here. Dad treats maintenance payments with the same baffled incredulity that his generation will soon adopt when told that wearing car seat belts is now the law. It's as if he can't believe the dumb literalism of it. What? Every month? The full amount? On time? Seriously? He has to be threatened with a court appearance before he starts supporting his family with anything like the same rigour with which he previously buggered it up. Quite devastating, but again worth reading out. In the above mentioned delusions of gender, Cordelia Fine cites a study from 2000 in which Mothers were shown an adjustable sloping walkway and asked to estimate the steepness of the slope their crawling 11 month old child could manage and would attempt. Girls and boys differed in neither their crawling ability nor risk taking when it came to testing them on the walkway, but mothers underestimated girls and overestimated boys, both in crawling ability and crawling attempts. 
I'm sure that most of those mothers would be horrified to hear that their gender assumptions had leaked into their behaviour like that, but to put it mildly, there's a lot of it about. Other studies have shown that when parents place birth announcements in newspapers, they are more likely to express pride if it's a boy and happiness if it's a girl. Indeed, if it's a girl, they're marginally less likely to make the announcement at all. It's just amused me the, the, the way he wrote about this, I guess. Blummin' hell, I can't even have a waz in peace, says the seven-year-old Roger as the three of us follow him into the boys' loo to watch him urinate. While I pretend to have my own wee, having a real one is impossible unless completely alone, I can't help being fascinated by the way Roger pulls his whole foreskin back on these occasions. It's not something I've been inclined to try for myself yet, just in case it's only my foreskin that's keeping the whole thing in one piece. I have visions of the round bit on the end just falling off. You can't be too careful about this kind of thing. We have a quote here from Unseen Academicals by Terry Pratchett. So each chapter starts out with a quote. This one here is, The thing about football, the important thing about football, is that it is not just about football. That's from Unseen Academicals where Ank Moorport gets his first football team. He talks about some of the books he read when he was young and I happen to have read them all. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, The Jungle Book and The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. So he talks... So he talks about luck, he says, So the thing or two I know about luck. Thing number one, you should do your best to notice luck so that you don't accidentally take credit for it. Thing number two, luck is not your fault. And when it comes to colossal strokes of good fortune, and there's a whopper coming up at the end of this chapter, it starts here. It starts with having a family who loves you and someone who inspires you to read. Not because reading makes you smart, although it helps, but because to involve yourself in a story is to imagine what it's like to be someone else. Generally, boys aren't much encouraged to do that. So he says... As for my father, well, the vexed issue of physical affection was avoided altogether because I hardly ever saw him. By the time I was a student, he would say hello and goodbye with a firm handshake. I was well into my 30s before I'd had enough of this handshake bullshit and gave him a hug. And this is an interesting thought experiment here, he says. It's incredible the way we stereotype girls and boys. Do it with race or religion and people would rightly look at you as if you were out of your mind. Try this. Let me condense some of the stuff I've heard said about boys by parents, friends, grandparents and even the odd teacher. Whenever you see the word boy or boys, substitute the word black or blacks. So I'm going to do that now. Leo, of course, is a typical black. He can't sit still. Yes, I know blacks can enjoy reading, but it doesn't come naturally. You know where you are with a black. They're so straightforward, aren't they? Emotionally uncomplicated. After all, blacks will be blacks. Are we having fun yet? Try this for girls. Substitute Muslim or Muslims. Muslims love flowers, don't they? I know it's unfashionable to say so, but if you can't get a Muslim interested in cookery, then you're doing something wrong. It's just that Muslims know, in their heart of hearts, that all they really need to do is sit around looking pretty. Ha, I'm joking, of course. Some Muslims want to have a career, and quite right, too. Yeah, we've all heard comments like that. He says, I don't want to spoil everyone's fun. I don't think Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, would be improved if the last line were not, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son, but rather, and which is more, you'll be an unrealistic paradigm of one person's idea of human virtue, my son slash daughter. That would clearly be shit. But however you feel about if, I'm fond of it, there is nothing exclusively masculine about the virtues listed. Kipling would probably disagree, but then so would a lot of people in 1909. He's talking about picking up books. He says, having done some reordering, we get a few minutes to choose a book to read by ourselves and then borrow. I head straight for D in fiction to find Terence Dix, my favourite Doctor Who author. I'm slightly ashamed of this because I know I ought to be looking for something more grown up like, I don't know, Agatha Christie or something. Talking about David Mitchell here, he says, David will spend his 20s being the only example I've ever known of a successful social smoker. He bums a couple of fags in the pub, good luck with that American readers, and then doesn't dream of having another the following morning. I don't mind this because every now and then he'll turn up with a pack of 10 and hand them over as a contribution to an ongoing tobacco kitty where I keep the change. I mean the spare cigarettes, rather than the mutation of a cancer cell. Although at some point I suppose I'll be keeping that change too. He says people who do a lot of walking away from human interaction are called unsociable, or sometimes writers. And he characterises this guy he doesn't like because um, he's dating somebody that he fancies. He's quite open and honest with like how bitter he was as a kid, I guess. I mean, I was the same, you know. I think when you're young and you don't know any better and society's like put all these pressures on you, you don't necessarily think of women as people like when you're a 15 year old boy or whatever and all your social environment or whatever all the other boys are just telling you like oh you need to go and have sex and stuff um but yeah he's describing this guy and uh, he says he plays pool like it's snooker plodding around the table lining up safety shots and chalking his cue interminably which i think is how i play snook uh, pool as well but that's because i love snooker snooker's great man okay just a few more bits in this that i want to highlight we have this quote here by Douglas Adams that comes up on my TV sometimes. You live and learn, at any rate, you live. This just tickled me the words he comes up with here. 
For one of the less formal colleges, Robinson sure knew how to give me the willies. The willies. Noun. Sensation of fear located in genitals. See also the fannies or the vulva tumbles. So I thought this was interesting. Uh, to be well enough to reject suicidal thoughts is not the same as being well enough not to have them in the first place. We are not responsible for our thoughts, of course. We are responsible only for our words and actions. There are no bad thoughts, only bad deeds. But obviously there are some lines of thought that are unhealthy to pursue. Two extreme examples being, how exactly am I going to murder this person who just barged onto the train when people were trying to get off? Or, how exactly am I going to murder myself? We all have wayward thoughts. We don't choose them, but we can choose not to follow them. I'm going to read these few paragraphs out as well because I think it highlights some of the double-edged sword nature of, uh, you know, toxic masculinity and all that. Once in a long-term relationship, men are worse than women at maintaining same-sex friendships. I don't mean talking bollocks with Gary in the pub, enjoyable as it is. I mean being able to tell Gary you've got cancer and expecting Gary to be able to listen. I'm not saying none of us have that kind of friend in our lives, but women seem to have about four each. That's fine as long as your wife doesn't die or divorce you. If she does, men are left higher and drier, not only because they relied on just one person for emotional support, but because they tend to be less plugged into the local community. If we do less of the school run, less of the shopping, less sitting in dentist waiting rooms with our kids, we aren't going to meet and get to know as many people, especially younger people. Loneliness is a man killer. Then there's work. Whether it's enjoyable, dangerous, repetitive, well paid, badly paid, fulfilling or soul destroying, work related stress is our problem, thank you. You women please, hello there, please stop banging on the door and smacking your heads against glass ceilings in the attempt to compete or support. Shh, we've got this. Ow, shit, my ulcer, my tumour. The ulcer on my tumour. At least we have a job. When we don't have a job. Fuck, I don't have a job. I'm not a man. My tumour. My ulcer. I don't know to what extent I agree with that, but I kind of agree with the general point he's making. He says, to put it childishly, if you want a vision of masculinity, imagine Dr. Frankenstein being constantly bum-raped by his own monster while shouting, I'm fine, everyone. I'm absolutely fine. So I thought this couple of paragraphs is actually remarkably similar to my own experience of what happened with me. Um... The three of us are also in an unthinkably close to exams production of Bedroom Farce, along with David and a few others. And I also do the two-man show with David. Oh yes, and I'm in the Footlights tour show again. It's almost as if I'm in denial. I'm pretty sure I'm handling this exam pressure brilliantly by pretending to feel no such thing. My body, on the other hand, knows otherwise. Which is probably why, one day as I get up from my desk, the floor leaps up and smacks me in the side of the head. My heart is beating itself stupid and the silence is roaring in my ears like a Vulcan bomber landing in my brain. I crawl over to the bed and lie still, wondering if I'm about to die. After a few seconds of careful breathing, everything returns to normal. Later that day, Jack tells me that this experience has a name, a panic attack. Oh, right, that's what that means then. I thought it was just a colourful way of saying you're a bit stressed out. Well, if it appears that I'm more worried than I thought I was about being hopelessly unprepared, then the solution is obvious. I go to Jenna's and we watch The Princess Bride. For me, it was like three seasons of MasterChef Australia. Talked about that he used to play Civilization 2, which is a great game. I used to play that as well. Here he talks about his dad's sort of good old fashioned northern conservatism and vague homophobia. Uh, we're watching Channel 4 News over tea as usual. There's a report about teenage suicide among boys who've been subjected to homophobic bullying. It's not bloody right, Dad says angrily into his pork chops, sausage, bacon, leeks, mashing cauliflower cheese. They're only little old boys. They can't help it if they're shirt lifters, bless them. He can do this, our dad. He can come out with statements so fantastically wrong and fantastically right in the space of one sentence that all I can do is prepare the next fork full of sausage, bacon and cauliflower. Not bloody right at all, he repeats. He's gearing up for something. He's getting himself cross enough for some kind of announcement. And I thought this was quite interesting. He goes, Dad made exceptions for me just as I made exceptions for him. His views on, sna his views on snooty, champagne socialist, metropolitan, formerly panaffectionate, middle-class Oxbridge lo lovies had to take a step back when he noticed he had one for his son. And my views of baby boomer, non-college educated, slightly racist, deeply sexist, angry white working class Tories was tempered by having one as a dad. This is the kind of forced empathy that villages, not just families, are rather good at. Given the divisiveness of the Brexit vote and the Trump presidency, I think it's worth saying that it's precisely these exceptions, these accommodations we have to make with each other, that create cracks in the wall of mutual suspicion and make possible a politics of civility, cracks which the algorithms and self-policing identity groups of Facebook and Twitter hastily try to paste over. Then he quotes Johnson from Peep Show as well, where he goes, uh, As Johnson in Peep Show said at Gerard's funeral, The scythe is remorseless. I hope the scythe's remorseless swing can bring some comfort to you all. Okay. So yeah, 
Those are my uh, flagged out bits from How Not To Be A Boy. Overall, I did think it was a really engaging memoir and it does do some great stuff in uh, challenging up, you know, perceptions of what gender is, especially in sort of today's 21st century society. I think you'd probably enjoy it more if you knew who Robert Webb was going into it, but there is still a lot there that you could enjoy in general. His writing style took me a little while to get into, but eventually I did enjoy it. And there was like a little quiz at the end, which I thought felt quite gimmicky. But overall, it was a pretty good memoir, especially for like a celebrity memoir. Although, again, he is a writer by trade, I guess, so you would expect it to be good. I give it like a probably a 4 out of 5 or a 3.75 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I thought of How Not To Be A Boy by Robert Webb. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon in another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.